Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Political State. I'm Ben Felder with The Oklahoman here in The Oklahoman's downtown video studios. Joining me is my uh, co-host and colleague Justin Wingeter. In today's episode, we're going to take a closer look at the transition team that Governor-elect Kevin Stitt is building around him. We're also going to dabble a little bit into the national politics. But in this first segment, we're going to welcome our guest this week, which is Councilwoman Nikki Nice, newly uh, elected Councilwoman to Oklahoma City's Ward 7. Councilwoman, thanks for your time and congratulations on the win. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you. Yeah, well, we talk a lot about state and national politics, but we always enjoy when we get a chance to kind of talk about municipal issues because in a lot of ways, these are some of the most important issues that are facing a lot of our, our listeners and viewers. Before we talk a little bit about kind of what lays ahead of you as a newly elected councilwoman, give us a little bit of a glimpse of your past, your background, and, and how you came to, to run for this council seat. Well, I was raised in Northeast Oklahoma City. I went to Millwood Public Schools from preschool to eighth grade. I then went to Northeast High School to be a part of the biomedical sciences program. So graduated from there. I went to uh, University of Central Oklahoma, studied there. Always knew I wanted to be a sportscaster. So that was my goal, to be a sportscaster. Uh, growing up in church, I've uh, been going to the same church, which is literally next door to Northeast High School, Great New Zion Baptist Church. Uh, we have a church broadcast, and so on Saturdays at the time, I would kind of help out uh, for Gospel Station 1220, and it was from 12 to 1, and I'd help sit in and learn radio, and then I realized, ooh, I think I like yeah. this, you know, so I, I started doing radio, uh, enjoyed that, would travel, get to go to gospel music workshops and things like that. And uh, then I said, you know, I, uh, what else can I do? So uh, I worked at, I had so many different jobs in between going to school. I uh, worked at Starbucks for a number of years. And uh, one day I had seen one of my um, former, uh, well, the, my now boss, well, ex-boss, uh, Terry Monday. And he came in and he ordered a beverage and I was making this beverage and I said, okay, can I get an internship? I said, you, you told me no my freshman year because he told me I needed to take more classes. Uh, and he said, you ready? And I said, yeah, I'm ready. Uh, so he said, call me. I made his drink, he left, and within about a month I was interning at the radio station for Perry Publishing and Broadcasting. So that internship turned into uh, 11 and a half years later. Um, and with that, obviously, I obtained my degree from Langston University in broadcast journalism and uh, studied abroad in West Africa and the Gambia and Senegal. And we uh, had articles published in the paper there. So uh, just being community involved and related has been my background all along, just uh, being a part of everything that's going on. My mom taught me how to be a servant because she was an usher and I ushered with her alongside her. Uh, and many people in my village, I call, call them my village. That's literally what raised me because I'm her only child. So it was a lot of hands on, on me yeah. uh, to help bring me to where I am. And then uh, just being involved and engaged in the community sparked a, a love for uh, just understanding local, national, uh, and international politics and uh, just being engaged and just, you know, when the time came um, to run, it was just kind of like, okay, am I going to do it or not? And I said, okay, let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I hit the ground running. Actually, uh, the story of it is I went, I had I'd taken my lunch. I called my mom and said, okay, mama, well, let's go. I grabbed her, went and got her. We, uh, and my friend, Mr. Bilberry, he met us up there. I filed on that Friday. So we had the filing period of th two days, 13th through 15th of June, and the seat was officially vacated by May 31st. Uh, so it was a very quick decision to make. And after that, I said, okay, what do we do now? <laughs> uh, so, and then we figured all of that out and we hit the ground running afterwards. So the first, uh, first uh, part of it we we did well and obviously we are here now yeah I mean so much of your background really you know kind of sets you up for a job like this I mean your involvement in your community even your uh, your career in, in broadcasting I mean communication is such an important job and you wouldn't be the only uh, Oklahoma City politician to have that background former mayor uh, Mick Cornett uh, got his start in sports broadcasting um, but so you run for this seat which represents um, you know much of East Oklahoma City in fact right before we were looking at the map and it goes into some places that people might not expect includes yeah. Bricktown goes south of the river 
river a little bit, even west of Edmond. It just it sounds it sounds like an interest. It's one of the more interesting shaped maps uh, for the ward. Um, but primarily, you know, what are East Oklahoma City? And I'm curious, what when you saw this this seat coming open, um, what did you feel like? East Oklahoma City needed in its next uh, uh, counselor, and, and why did you feel like you, you were the best fit for that? Well, I knew we needed to pr protect the progress that had already been set and was being made, so uh, that is why I wanted to run, because I, I wanted to continue to be the voice to make sure that the progress would continue, that we were continue, continuing to move forward, and, and making sure that our residents and constituents are able to receive uh, the necessity in those items, the retail, you know, just the quality of life that we know is necessary for the area, because even a lot of people uh, during our campaign run, some of our uh, my opponents uh, may mention, which is true, I guess it, to me it's like something we already know, but the average life expectancy in Northeast Oklahoma City is 18 years less. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's alarming. But I guess when you're already in it, it doesn't phase you because you're used to it. And I think uh, mm -hmm. to bring those, those things back to the forefront helps us to engage more into it, to invest more into the quality of life, and also to help understand uh, why when it is important to bring people back to the community, to invest in the community, to make sure it sustains itself, and also uh, to make sure to let our generations, uh, future generations know, this is where you need to be. This is, um, you know, like a hidden gem, if you will, because you have access to highways, you know, literally right there. You're within minutes uh, to different places you need to go, but the lack of adequate grocery stores, the lack of adequate retail, the leakage that leaves the area of Ward 7 is definitely an alarming issue. And we need to um, make sure we're keeping that. And uh, obviously we know that our city runs on sales tax. So if our sales tax dollars are going outside of Ward 7, that's not something that we want. We want those sales tax dollars to stay in, in Ward 7. We have the Adventure District, and consider this. You know, you have people that come from all across the globe in the summer, once a year, to play at the uh, softball complex. They go outside of the ward, a lot of them, hit the highway, and just come back. We have to make sure we're capturing them, making that adventure, in that adventure district and they want to bring everyone else that they know to be a part of what we have because Ward 7 is definitely where the action is and we want to make sure we keep the action but we also don't want to leave our residents behind in the process so uh, those are just two folds as far as where I, I balance because I want to make sure my residents are taken care of first and foremost but I also want to make sure those amenities are there as well. Yeah. I was talking to Dave, uh, Mayor Holt uh, last week. We were talking about female candidates been doing very well in this election. He mentioned you and how he was very impressed with you. Have you had a chance to talk to the mayor and how do you think that uh, re relationship will work? I have talked to the mayor uh, actually during my campaign run. I talked to him oh, okay. uh, quite a few times and I'm thankful that he found interest in my campaign, that he was cheering me on on the side as much as he could and uh, that other people were invested and in, in decided to have interest in my campaign because uh, at the end of the day, you know, I met so many different women along this journey that I had never imagined would happen or even uh, that would run and I'm thankful for that opportunity and I share in those victories on on uh, November the 6th I was cheering and screaming at my own victory party my watch party for the other women that I knew uh, that were on the ballot that were at least uh, making those strides or on top and uh, you know just with the success of Kendra Horn with the success of all of the female judges that were elected uh, and even me myself having that opportunity to vote for a woman in pretty much every category on my ballot. I mean, this was, I think, historical in itself to think about those things. And I, I think, you know, obviously when we look at the numbers nationally, uh, the, all of those House seats that were up for grabs, half of those uh, seats, women were on the ballot. And obviously uh, about half of those women made it 
uh, made it to the house. But I mean, this is this is what it means. And especially for Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, we're progressing. Uh, women have a voice. We've always had a voice. You know, we share uh, this year with the 100th anniversary of women uh, receiving the right to vote. So I think all of those things, when you take those things into consideration, uh, this was just the year for women. This was the year for educators. It was just the year in general uh, for a lot of change to happen. Yeah. You know, I think about uh, earlier this week you had your um, you know a ceremony to take the oath uh, you officially became a counselor actually a week or two ago but it was kind of the ceremony a lot of family and friends at City Hall for this uh, for this occasion um, and you had a chance to speak and you talked a lot about you know following the footsteps of those who came before you and you, you talked about former uh, counselors such as Willa Johnson um, but then also kind of you know, hoping to see yourself could kind of play a role in inspiring others to run for office I mean you had never sought political office before and it's a pretty intimidating process to just decide that you're going to run. For most people, they kind of need that introduction into, into city government. One of the best ways to do that is for individuals to serve on, on boards and commissions and committees that make up um, so much of the policy shaping that happens at City Hall. Something we've reported on here is just a, a, a m immense lack of diversity on those boards. Th those are positions that the mayor fills. Uh, new mayor David Holt has said that he wants to include diversity into some of his decisions. What role do you play as, as a counselor? And not to define you simply as a woman and a woman of color, but the council has a lack of diversity. These boards and seats have a lack of diversity. You have an important voice, and how do you hope to use that voice in, in having City Hall better reflect what is a growingly diverse city? Bleeding by example, as you mentioned, but obviously making sure I educate those that are around me about what local government does, because a lot of us don't understand. You know, we think uh, that you know we are calling the senator about something for uh, our backyard mm -hmm. when technically no. That's, that's a local issue. Uh, but making sure we're filtering the information in the correct way, also finding um, people who can fill those seats. And I, I actually, I did it backwards because like you said, I, I did I did not, I was not on a board. I wasn't on any of those uh, committees. I, I did it in a way that was probably just kind of unprecedented for some. Um, but being able to myself appoint people around me that I know would be successful or want to learn the process, uh, making sure, unfortunately, uh, to remove some of those people or if they've termed out that have been in those seats for so long, uh, we need fresh we need fresh ideas. We need fresh people to fill those roles. We need fresh people to uh, help to navigate and to move different uh, boards and commissions and trusts uh, moving forward because when you look at it and even some of the meetings that I've been sitting in most recently, it's just kind of like, ooh, how long have they been on that board? You know, how long have they been on this trust? Uh, is there somebody else? You know, what what can we do? And I think uh, it's important for our older generation to take the younger generation seriously because we do have a voice. They built this city for us and now we're creating a city for the future. So I think it's time for us, the time has been here for us and uh, it's important for uh, us, our generation and um, obviously I say people of color but I do include women uh, to be engaged, be a part of the process but I just mean young people in general. So I, that you know that has no color boundary when I say young people in general because it is important uh, that if we are not a part of the process as we have seen people uh, that are older that are already setting their ideas are going to be making decisions for us that are probably not the decisions we would make for ourselves yeah we talked about the boundaries of Ward 7 and you know you you mentioned a few of the you know some of the city's most popular attractions are there uh, you know you've got Bricktown you've got the Adventure District the softball complex the zoo uh, you know the OU uh, you know Health Science Center um, so it's got a lot of notable landmarks but it's also a community um, that has often felt ignored um, by the city and we've seen a lot of investment in downtown and, and but you know you talk to people on the east side of Oklahoma City the south side of Oklahoma City there's a feeling that some of those areas get neglected we're at the beginning stages of the city coming up with its next MAPS project. And there seems to be more of an emphasis on how do we kind of spread that investment beyond just the downtown core uh, into our neighborhoods. I'm curious, how do you hope to shape that conversation? I mean, obviously it's larger than just the city council, but when it comes to your ward and your community, how do you think this next MAPS uh, uh, project 
um, could benefit your community. What, how do you hope to shape that conversation? Well, I want to make sure that people understand uh, first, I guess, how we have to move it in a way where they're not going to be neglected. Because I think that's, that's the first thing, to build the trust for it. Because uh, with some of the maps, previous maps that we've had for uh, Oklahoma City, as you said, the east side did feel neglected. The east side uh, did feel that they did not get their share, fair share of even like maps for kids. We've heard a lot of, of disagreements with that on, in some of our communities. Uh, so we have to make sure we're building the trust for our, our people in our those areas and residents uh, to to understand this will be for you this will be for uh, your future generations so let's build it together uh, to put your input in what would you like to see I know I personally uh, would like to see a, a better regional transit uh, for our areas because obviously that's the wave of the future and we're gonna have to connect uh, this area we're gonna have to connect the ward our ward is so large and vast and as we see how Luther we go way out to Luther and we have to come all the way down to northeast side or come all the way down to Bricktown downtown all the way down to the south side southeast side we have to connect Connected. And that's that's one of the things I definitely want to make sure we're doing, connecting our ward at the end of the day. Um, I would say, obviously, we want to bring those uh, amenities, attractions, and things like that. But economic development is obviously a, a piece, but we want the right economic development. I want to make sure those who are going to be in the area are okay with the economic development. I mean, obviously, there will be, unfortunately, some sacrifices to be made in order for us to grow, but I want every I want to make sure that we're transparent about the process. And I think that's where the lack of trust has been because uh, people don't feel that the city or local government or even national government is transparent about making sure they get the information. So um, I believe uh, when people decided to cast that vote for me, they believe that I will be transparent and that's that's the plan that I have to be transparent uh, whether it's the I'm going to give you the positive and I'm going to give you the negative so here's what we can do to come in between to make sure that it is conducive for everyone involved in making sure that our our young and all, as well as our season are taken care of first and foremost so those are uh, the maps for I'm actually excited about what could take place um, but I, I it's just going to be a task to make sure others are motivated uh, about it and making sure they get success at the end as well yeah well that'll be a big project on your plate uh, you were you had another big project uh, put on your plate immediately and that was the selection of a new city manager powerful position in city government uh, typically this person is in office for decades uh, and right off the bat you're asked to hey join the join the uh, the search and replacement or uh, the search for a new city manager of which um, you cast your vote for yesterday um, and I know you voted in favor because our, our Bill, Bill Crum of the Oklahoma reported in today's paper that it was a unanimous vote. Uh, so tell us about that process. Um, you know, you were just kind of being thrown into the deep end on this after being elected and searching for a new city manager. How much of a say did you feel like you had? Did you feel like you had the ability to ask, you know, ask questions? And then, and then why did you um, join your fellow counselors in, in voting, um, voting for the new city manager? Well, uh, Freeman and stuff. Yeah. Well, I'll say. Um, after the election, technically I was to be sworn in on the day of, mm -hmm. uh, but because of this process, and I think we hadn't had this process done in about 18 years, they decided that we needed to swear, uh, get sworn in a day early to make sure I was a part of the process, which I, I'm actually thankful for because this is, you know, being a, a new council person, this is a huge decision because this is a person who's going to be managing the city and making sure that our wants, uh, uh, even as far as a council and mayor, as well as community, are implemented and uh, implemented effectively. So when it came to uh, me actually receiving the information, that is why I had to be sworn in early, uh, at least take my oath early, and that was, I believe, last Tuesday, and uh, to go over the applicants and making sure myself, I knew uh, what I was I was looking at and and technically you know just I found out through the interviews that most city managers have a history of about five years so we had a very special thing happening with Mr. Jim Couch being here as long as he did um, so with that 
uh, it was definitely uh, making sure that we had the right person in place. Um, uh, the decision was to make sure we had someone who, who knew the city, uh, who knew financial parts of the city, uh, who obviously was vested in uh, the employees that are here. And we had uh, some really great applicants. We had a, a lot of external applicants, a lot of internal applicants as well. And uh, that was the one thing that I, the internal applicants were grateful that we decided to at, uh, probably go inside as far as seeking applicants. You know, a lot of places don't. They go straight outside. Uh, but uh, we are thankful. Um, Mr. Freeman, I think he's going to be a great uh, city manager. I, I did say, you know, I am new, so I trust the judgment of all. Uh, I did express my opinions as far as every person that we interviewed, so I, I am thankful they allowed me to do that. And obviously it was a unanimous decision at the end of the day. And I think uh, what he brings to the table, he will be a, an effective city manager and he will also lift as he climbs. So uh, just making sure that his correct people are in place, the assistant city managers and those directors, and also uh, making sure the staff is, is uh, informed, they're educated, and they're also uh, able to help us as far as uh, to move our city in, in the correct way. Yeah, well one big vote right out of the gate. Um, I'm telling you, I don't know how to take <laughs> yeah. all of this. I yeah. was like from interviews day one to a whole council meeting and a vote day two, I'm tired. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm tired already. You, you hit the ground running, but there's going to be uh, plenty more big votes uh, down the road. <laughs> You're so. right. Uh, new Ward 7 Councilwoman Nikki Nice. Councilwoman, thank you so much for your time. We thank really you appreciate for it. Me. I appreciate you both. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back uh, for the second half of this week's episode of Political State. Welcome back to Political State from the Oklahoma and alongside Justin Wingeter. I'm Ben Felder, and Justin, I want to get into a few uh, state and national issues, but real quick to kind of follow up on our conversation with Councilwoman Nice, who joined us in the first segment here. You know, one of the first things on her plate was voting for a new city manager, and I, I, I think that's really important because, you know, as someone who's covered a lot of uh, city councils and school boards, one thing that's always interesting to me is that you know the the city manager the school district superintendent they work for the boards they work for the city councils and sometimes you don't always get that impression from the elected officials a lot of times it's because there's an there's an effort to have this kind of symbiotic relationship and and that kind of thing but a lot of times you ask a, a, a council person or a school board member questions about the you know the work of the manager or the superintendent and they're told well you know they're they're leading us in a direction and that kind of thing and that is true but at the end of the day, they still work for those elected officials. And I think it's important for a newly elected councilwoman, especially one who's not been in political office before, to have that reinforced right off the bat, that this is a hire that you made and that they work uh, at the pleasure of the council. Yeah, she was clearly appreciative of being brought in on that process, and understandably so. It was um, a, a good gesture, not more than just a gesture. It was a good uh, you know, process to bring her in, let her be involved in those uh, that decision right away, a major decision. but. Uh, yeah, I'm interested to see what uh, uh, Councilwoman Nice uh, does. She clearly brings some new ideas. Uh, politically speaking, I mean, pretty impressive to not even be involved in politics at all. I and mean, not only win your first election, but to come from not even a political background at all. It really, uh, pretty impressive there. I mean, not unheard of, obviously. Yeah. We have a governor-elect yeah. who, who just did the same thing. but. Uh, that, that was uh, pretty impressive. I'm fascinated to see what she uh, has to do or what she does uh, in this new role. Yeah, well, that'll be interesting. Well, you mentioned the governor-elect, so let's talk about that. Uh, kind of a quiet season of politics, a little bit of a, of a rest for some after such a big election season. The state legislature will get things rolling here in a couple months. Um, in mid-January, Governor-elect Kevin Stitt will t formally take the oath of office, but he's already kind of putting together a transition team, uh, conducting interviews for key staff positions that we hope to hear more about in the coming days. But I wanted to ask you about this transition team. I mean, these are individuals that are kind of, uh, you know, you're building kind of a formal team around you to help with the transition, uh, hiring some of these key staff positions, um, filling out uh, policy committees um, that are going to help shape the platform for the governor-elect. Um, there's been two uh, two rounds of transition team announcements. Yeah. Last week we saw uh, eight or nine members. Yesterday we saw another group of, I, th I think, eight members or so. Um, and here's one thing that was kind of striking to me. Last week there was, it leaned a little bit heavy on the uh, 
kind of government and political experience. In fact, a, a lot of Stitt's opponents immediately said, you know, he's just filling himself, he's filling his team with uh, government insiders. Um, yesterday, it seemed to lean a little bit more on the business experience yeah. and the outsider's experience. I heard Stitt's opponents say, you don't have anybody around him that knows what he's doing when it comes <laughs> to government. So it's a lose-lose, uh, as it always is with your opponents. Um, but, uh, but that did seem noticeable, that this first batch kind of seemed to ha lean a little bit more on the government experience. This one seemed to lean a little bit more on the outsider's experience. And that's going to be the dance, I think, for this governor who has no political experience of his own except for right. just winning a, a statewide campaign for the first time. Well, it's electoral experience. That's not yeah. government experience. Yeah. And, and yeah, obviously, uh, he, he's talked about this business-like approach for however many months now, and he, that's going to follow through. I know that there's going to be some of that in the Stitt administration. He does need to bring in politically experienced people, people who know how to uh, find compromise, uh, get through things through the legislature, and there is some of that in this team. I, uh, I don't put a lot of emphasis on transition teams, or sometimes it's symbolic. Um, it, it does show where his mind is, mm -hmm. and it shows who he wants to hear from, and what are some critical months. It's a little inside baseball, but I think our show can be yeah, that way, yeah. <laughs> and our, our viewers and listeners can be that way sometimes, and that's okay, and that's great, And but it's, um, it can just be a little a little wonky as to who he's hearing from, but that is more important than a lot of people probably imagine. Well, and maybe more important for this governor, because I think yes. it, that you know, even a symbolic transition team is gonna maybe be scrutinized in a way that it wouldn't have been for other candidates had they had they won the election. Let's yeah. take Lieutenant Governor Todd Lamb, for example. You know, if he had won the election and a year ago everyone assumed that he would, um, if he was becoming the next governor and he had hired a transition team or staff members of government insiders, nobody would really bat an eye. I mean, you would scrutinize the backgrounds and stuff like you all, that you always do. Um, and, and if he hired an outsider or two, you know, no one would really, you know, raise much of an issue with that. But when you have someone like Governor Lex Stitt, who has no government experience, and like you said, ran on that outsider's uh, uh, banner, whoever he hires is going to be a point for or against in the eyes of many people. Is he an outsider? Is he an insider? And some of that's kind of, I mean, it's a little silly. I mean, if he ends up, if his chief of staff ends up being someone who's worked in government before, people are going to say, oh, the outsider is filling his team with insiders. But you still need that balance, right? You need some people who know, you know where the offices are in the Capitol, know who the major players are. Yeah. But I do think for Stitt, he's going to be judged by who he, the company he keeps, maybe more so than, than other, other governors. I think that's, that's fair. Yeah, I think that's accurate. And I mean, look, when the guy at the top has no political experience, the people below him should have some, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how much he cares about that. But when, when you're coming in from an outsider perspective, you need some government people in there. That's, if you want to call that you know, being an insider or whatever, fine. But I, I mean, I think you have to have some people in there who know how the game is played. And if he wants to come in from an outsider perspective, and he obviously will, then I think you, you just should surround yourself with some people who, who do know how government operates. Yeah. So this Sunday, I have a story uh, working um, with our news director, Chris Castile, on that kind of takes a look at Stitt's inner circle, especially that inner circle that was with him from the very beginning mm -hmm. that remains very close. It's, it's mostly family and friends. And, and you know, family and friends are always a part of a, cam of a campaign. Um, but family and friends that also didn't have any political experience, some friends that had no political experience running any, any kind of campaign were now running his campaign. Um, and what struck me is he, he kind of surrounded himself with mostly outsiders who knew him really well and knew what he was about and knew that if, you know, win or lose, he was going to do it as, as Kevin Stitt, as the CEO. And yeah. he seemed to really support a lot of his instincts. And some of his instincts is to, um, you know, have those around him, debate their ideas and, and, and you know, gather, gather up information. Some of his instincts is to, you know, to make gut calls as a CEO. But he really surrounded himself with a team of people that knew who he was and knew to encourage him to be himself. And it's going to be curious to me, I'm curious to see what, you know, his key staff positions around him, you know, how they, how they take on that role. If any of his inside circles are hired onto that, um, from his inside circle are hired onto his staff. But one thing that, I, a, a quote I have in the story, um, Alex Wentz, who is a former communications director for Mary Fallon, right. about as insider as you can get. I don't mean that as a criticism <laughs> or a compliment, yeah, but yeah. I mean, you know, a, a, an experienced um, politician um, who served in both national and state politics. 
And Wynn said, listen, I think the executive office, the governor's office, probably lends itself to his CEO more than anything else. That his business experience can play really well here. That the fact that he doesn't have government experience may not mean as much for a governor as it would for, say, you know, a United States senator or, or another position. Um, and with this new uh, round of transition team members announced yesterday, it seems like Stitt is going to lean heavily on a lot of other business leaders um, who, who he probably gets along with and they understand the same lingo and, and that kind of thing. And so uh, that balance of insider versus outsider, I mean, he's going to have to deal with that, uh, you know, his, 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 whole, uh, his whole time in office. Yeah, well, the role of the executive certainly lends itself more to a, a businessman. It's not the same as being a CEO, but it's similar, more similar than being a senator where you're one of 100 mm -hmm. in the U.S. Senate at least, or one of 40. And um, so there is... There are some similarities there. Obviously, when you talk about surrounding himself with family and friends and people who know him, people he likes talking with and likes bouncing ideas off of, I mean, I, I think of the president. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hate to always come back to the president on this show, but that was the first idea that came to my mind. And obviously, the president has surrounded himself with family and friends and people who, for the most part, know him. And when he's tried to bring in government insiders that hasn't always gone very well. They haven't lasted very long sometimes. Um, so I do see some similarities there, excuse me. Yeah. Um, I know uh, Governor Lex Stitt sometimes likes those similarities and then uh, he'll also tell you he has some differences just in style from the president. I think. Yeah, and, and, and here's where I think the similarities with Trump kind of are sim where they are similarities and where they aren't. I mean, both of them have that lack of experience, you know, in, in running government. Um, Trump doesn't seem to be someone who feels like he needs to get down into the weeds so much. And maybe I'm selling him short, I don't know. You know, I'm not an expert on the president. But from, you know, from following his administration, he doesn't seem like someone who, you know, if it's, a, if it's an issue he doesn't have experience in, whether it's veteran affairs or, uh, you know, the, the you know, budgets or whatever it is. You know, he doesn't feel like he has to get down into the weeds. He's got people that can do that for him. Yeah. He really kind of stays at surface level and really tries to control the messaging. Stitt, from a lot of people I've talked to around him, say that he's, you know, he's very inquisitive, really wants to know things, and ask questions that sometimes you wouldn't expect you know, the most important person in the room to ask because he comes across like he doesn't know what he's talking about. Because you know, that's always the danger in asking a question, right? You know, your teacher always said there are no stupid questions. If you're the governor, there may be some stupid questions, or at least perceived stupid questions. People are like, why does he not know the answer to this? Yeah. But that's going to be interesting, that that is how he has run his business, according to a lot of people I've talked to around him. They see, there is no stupid question. That he's going to not feel insecure about not knowing a topic because what's important to him is getting to the bottom of it and learning it. And so that is where I think is going to be interesting, is to see um, where are those times where he, cho he, he kind of chooses to show what he doesn't know, is he honest about what he doesn't know? Does he know what he doesn't know? And what are the other times where he feels like, you know, that's not the best look for a governor to not appear like I don't know what's going on here. I think that's going to be an interesting thing to watch as well. Yeah, he needs to know what he doesn't know. And mm -hmm. he doesn't know a lot of things, and that's fine. That, mm -hmm. It's all new to him. This is new. Uh, and there's no shame in that. Anyone coming in would have a, several things, at least, that they know they don't know. <laughs> and you have to be willing to say that. Now, there are avenues for doing that, and that's why you surround yourself with people that you're comfortable yes. with, so you can say that out loud, <laughs> yes. and they're not going to run, as much as we like people to run to the reporters, they're not going to run to reporters and say, did you know, this? You know the governor like doesn't know this? Uh, as Trump sometimes has people around him who are quick to tell reporters, here's all the yeah. things Trump doesn't know or refuses to find out. Um, so he is... There's, there's a time and place for that. You don't want to stand up at the state of the state and say, I don't understand basic government functions. Probably not a good line. If it, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> but if he's, if he's in a company that he's comfortable saying that and learning about that, well, that's, that's a, positive, a positive development, in my opinion. Yeah, and that inner circle includes his wife, uh, college friends, um, that you can be vulnerable with and ask those right. questions. Um, uh, so, yeah, it'll be interesting to watch that transition there. Uh, real, real quick, let's talk a little bit about national politics. Um, right now, I, one of the bigger stories, there's so many of them, but uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi, uh, whether or not she's going to become uh, return as, as Speaker of the House, there's been so much talk about uh, some in, in the Democrats and Democratic wing wanting to see new leadership. Yeah. Uh, we had uh, 
a newly elected congresswoman, Kendra Horn, on, was it last week or a couple weeks ago? I can't yeah. remember. But she said, I'm not committed to voting for Pelosi. She may not have a choice now, it seems like. I don't, we don't know. There doesn't seem to be any uh, candidates coming in, out of the woodworks to challenge her. Yeah, no one else is, seems to be lining up. It looks like Pelosi will get it. Um, this makes it a little easier for Horn. I mean, she was going to face a very, she's already faced a very contentious uh, question. I, I talked to her last week, I think it was, or maybe a week and a half ago, uh, and she gets asked the Pelosi question all the time, and she kind of laughed it off. But it, it's nonetheless, you know, you're trying to get into your orientation, you're just learning the lay of the land, and you are <laughs> being asked a pretty contentious, very partisan and political question very early on. This might take that edge off a little bit. I mean, she may not just, she just may not have a choice. Mm -hmm. um, you're right, she came on the show and, and we appreciate having her on and we talked about this for several questions uh, to her and she clearly wants someone who is different. She would like Democratic leadership to be different and Nancy Pelosi obviously is not different. She's been there before and uh, you really got the sense from Horn that she did want somebody other than Pelosi but no one is stepping up so it's going to have to be Pelosi. And, uh, th that again, just it saves her a, a very early on contentious vote um, because I, I don't think there will be another choice. Yeah, you know, a Democratic Congresswoman from a longtime Republican seat is going to naturally probably not be, you know, fully in embracing Pelosi because you know she's often seen as, you know, a negative character in the eyes of Republicans. I mean, we saw that in the governor's race. Uh, the, uh, supporters of Stitt were running ads comparing Democrat Drew Edmondson to Nancy Pelosi. Yeah. But uh, Edmondson did win Oklahoma County, which makes up the bulk of this fifth, fifth district. So even though, you know, she may have to think about what does it mean to be a, you know, a, re a Democratic representative in a district that's still pretty moderate or a longtime Republican, I'm not sure that Pelosi is quite the boogeyman in Oklahoma County and in the 5th District, as she is obviously in the, in the rest of the state. Um, but if it's not a vote on Pelosi, it's going to be a vote on something else. I mean, Horn is going to have to, there's going to be some difficult votes for her. She's not, you know, a Democrat from, from Berkeley, California. I mean, no. She's a Democrat from Oklahoma City, and it may be transitioning more Democratic, but this is still a pretty, right now, I, I think you can, it's fair to say this is a purple district. Yeah, and on the show, I, I called her a moderate, and she went along with that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a moderate Democrat, and that's how she ran her campaign. That's how I expect her to be, and it's going to be fascinating to watch the vote she takes uh, because I, I could see on a you know a moderate Republican bill her joining that I could see and I, I could see her um, you know balking at some of the more liberal bills that come through even though they're coming from her party so it'll be fascinating to watch I, I don't want to predict anything and I may have uh, mischaracterized that but I, I think it's going to be uh, interesting to watch because I she even and if there are tight votes in the House. You could even be somewhere in the middle, somewhere of a swing vote um, on, an, on some interesting legislation. Yeah, and she's going, you know, she's going to have to face re-election in just a couple of years. Uh, it's going to come quick. And, you know, she's probably going to want to have some votes in her pocket that she could tell some of her Republican supporters because she obviously did have some Republican support um, to say, listen, I'm not just a, you know, an extreme progressive. Um, there are times where I can work with the other side of the aisle and I can make the votes that make sense for Oklahoma City and, and not so much just for the West and East Coast. So it'll be interesting to see that as that develops. Well, that's going to do it for this week's episode of Political State. Uh, record a little bit early as we got the Thanksgiving holiday coming up. So happy Thanksgiving to you and yours. With Justin, I'm Ben. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back for another episode next week.